Section 1 of Chapter 17 is entitled Mobilizing for Defense. After Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, they thought that America would avoid further conflict with them. The Japan Times newspaper said America was trembling in their shoes. But if America was trembling, it was trembling with rage, not fear. Remember Pearl Harbor was the rallying cry as America entered World War II. Americans rushed to enlist. After Pearl Harbor, five million Americans enlisted to fight in the war. The Selective Service expanded the draft and eventually provided an additional 10 million soldiers. Women joined the fight. Army Chief of Staff General George Marshall pushed for the formation of the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, the WAAC, also called WAC. Under this program, women worked in non-combat roles such as nurses, ambulance drivers, radio operators, and pilots. All Americans fought in World War II. Despite discrimination at home, minority populations contributed to the war effort. One million African Americans served in the military. 300,000 Japanese American, Mexican Americans served in the military. 33,000 Japanese Americans, 25,000 Native Americans, and 13,000 Chinese Americans. This photograph in this slide shows the Golden 13 Great Lakes officers scoring the highest marks ever on the officer exam in 1944. World War II is also known as a production miracle. Americans converted the automobile industry into a war industry. The nation's automobile plants began to produce tanks, planes, boats, and command cars. Many other industries also converted to war-related supplies. Labor contributed to the war effort. By 1944, nearly 18 million workers were laboring in war industries. This is three times the number that were working in war industries in 1941. More than 6 million of these workers were women, and nearly 2 million of these workers were minorities. World War II also saw the mobilization of scientists for the war effort. In 1941, FDR created the Office of Scientific Research and Development, the OSRD, to bring scientists into the war effort. Focus was on radar and sonar technologies to locate submarines. Also, the scientists worked to develop new medicines like penicillin, as well as new pesticides like DDT. The contribution of scientists is most significantly seen through the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project was the most important achievement of the OSRD and was developed in secret as it led to the first atomic explosion of the atomic bomb. Einstein wrote to FDR warning him that the Germans were attempting to develop such a weapon. The code used to describe American efforts to build the bomb was the Manhattan Project. The federal government took control of inflation. With the prices of consumer goods threatening to rise out of control, FDR responded by creating the Office of Price Administration, the OPA. The OPA froze prices on most goods and encouraged the purchase of war bonds to fight inflation. This is how a centrally planned socialist government works and the United States ceased to be a capitalist economy during World War II. Yearly inflation from 1910 to 1990 shows how the inflation rate jumped up and down between 1930 and 1950. After 1950, inflation rose at a more manageable pace until 1971, when the price controls and the centralized control of the economy by the government were finally removed. 
and after those controls were removed, the spikes in inflation continued again. The War Production Board was the federal government's project to ensure the troops had ample resources. The War Production Board decided which companies would convert to wartime production and how to best allocate raw materials to those industries, further evidence of a socialized, central planned gov uh, economy. Collection drives were also organized by the War Production Board to collect scrap, iron, tin cans, paper, rags, and cooking fat, all necessary for the war effort. Additionally, the Office of Price Administration set up a system of rationing, allowing each American family a limited amount of sugar, and gasoline, and other needed materials so that the military would be able to fight the war. This is further evidence of a centrally planned socialist government operating within the United States in World War II. Households had set allocations of scarce goods such as gas, meat, shoes, sugar, and coffee. World War II also saw the creation of propaganda by the federal government to encourage uh, the American people to sacrifice for the war effort. This is a World War II poster encouraging the conservation of gasoline by joining a car sharing club. It says, when you ride alone, you ride with Hitler, meaning that those who do not work together as under a socialist economy would s help by weakening the American response to Hitler's threats. These are examples of ration stamps from World War II. Each family would be given a certain number of stamps each month, and every time they purchased something, one or more stamps would be taken. Section 2 of Chapter 17 describes the war uh, in North Africa and in Southern Europe. Days after Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt and met with Prime Minister Winston Churchill. They decided to focus on defeating Hitler first and then to turn their attention to Japan. The Battle of the Atlantic. After America's entry into the war, Hitler was determined to prevent food and war supplies from reaching Britain and the USSR. He ordered submarine raids on US ships in the Atlantic. During the first four months of 1942, Germany sank 87 U.S. ships. This is a poster showing the Battle of the Atlantic. A quotation from Winston Churchill is at the top. The Battle of the Atlantic was the dominating factor all through the war. Allies began to control U-boats. In the first seven months of 1942, German U-boats sank 681 Allied ships in the Atlantic. Something had to be done or the war at sea would be lost. First, the Allies used convoys of ships and airplanes to transport supplies. Destroyers used sonar to track U-boats. Airplanes were used to track the U-boats' ocean surfaces. With this improved tracking, the Allies inflicted huge losses on German U-boats. Here you can see a map showing the Atlantic Ocean and the uh, main convoy routes used by the Allies to bring supplies from the United States to England. The red dots were are Allied merchant ships that were sank. The green dots are the German U-boats that were sank. The Eastern Front of World War II and the Mediterranean is also detailed in this section. Hitler wanted to wipe out Stalingrad, a major industrial center for the Soviet Union. In the summer of 1942, the Germans took the offensive in the southern Soviet Union. 
By the winter of 1943, the Allies began to see victories on land as well as on the ocean. The first great battle of the war, the first great turning point of the war, was the Battle of Stalingrad. The Battle of Stalingrad was uh, one of the most important and most brutal battles of World War II. For weeks, the Germans had pressed in on Stalingrad. Then the winters set in while the Germans were still wearing their summer uniforms. Unable to be resupplied, the brutal winter killed many on both sides in this battle. The battle ultimately was fought door to door, street to street, house to house in sub-zero temperatures for months. The Germans ultimately surrendered in January of 1943, but not before the Soviet Union had lost more than one million men in the battle. This is more than twice the entire number of U.S. deaths in the entire war, both in against Japan as well as Germany uh, and the Italians. It also begs the question of where was the United States if it truly was supporting its ally, the Soviet Union? Why did so many Soviets have to die without any support from the United States or England? On the Northern African Front, the United States was busy with Operation Torch, an invasion of the Axis-controlled North African region. It was launched by American General Dwight D. Eisenhower in 1942. Allied troops landed in Casablanca, Oran, and the Algiers in and the country of Algeria. They sped towards the Africa Corps in their tanks, the Africa Corps being led by German General Edwin Rommel. Here's a map showing where the United States landed in North Africa uh, near Casablanca, the Oran, and Algiers. After taking North Africa, the Allies, FDR and Churchill, met in Casablanca to decide their next moves. They decided to plan an amphibious invasion of France and Italy. The only condition for surrender uh, would be an unconditional surrender. The Italian campaign happened after the United States defeated Germany in North Africa and after the Soviets lost a million soldiers at Stalingrad. The Italian campaign got off to a good start as the Allies quickly took the island of Sicily. And at that point, King Emmanuel III stripped Mussolini of all his power and had him arrested. However, Hitler's forces continued to resist the Allies in Italy. Heated battles were fought until it went in uh, and it wasn't until 1945 that Italy had s been secured by the Allies. The Tuskegee Airmen is a great story of African-American participation in World War II. Among the brave men who fought in Italy were the pilots of the all-black 99th Squadron, the Tuskegee Airmen. The pilots made numerous effective strikes against Germany and won two distinguished unit citations. This is a photograph showing members of the 99th Squadron in North Africa. The Allies also went on to liberate Europe through the uh, very dramatic invasion of France known as Operation Overlord. It was led by American General Dwight D. Eisenhower, also known as D-Day, the invasion of North France involved three million U.S. soldiers as well as British troops and was set on June 6, 1944. D-Day was, was the largest land, sea, and air operation in military history, and despite massive air support, the German retaliation was brutal. 
especially at Omaha Beach. However, within a month, the Allies had landed more than one million troops, 567,000 tons of supplies, and 170,000 vehicles. This is a famous picture taken at D-Day on Omaha Beach. The Germans were in the hills above the beach, which had targeted the, play, uh, the troops with artillery and machine gun fire. The beach was full of landmines, barbed wire, and, and other deadly traps, and many thousands of men died trying to storm the beach. Here's the landing at Normandy. Planes also dropped a new type of soldier invented for D-Day known as the paratroopers, men who jumped out of the airplanes behind enemy lines in Normandy, France, were trained to sabotage roads and bridges as well as communications. Losses were extremely heavy on D-Day, and this was anticipated knowing full well that most of the first troops on the beach would be killed. But once on the beach, uh, the Germans would be overwhelmed by this human wave tactic. By September of 1944, the Allies had freed France, Belgium, and Luxembourg. The good news, and the American people's desire not to change horses in midstream, helped elect FDR to an unprecedented fourth term. FDR was running against the Republican John Dewey, shown here, and won in a landslide. The Battle of the Bulge is Germany's last stand. With the Allies having liberated France, the Germans knew that as the Soviets pushed in from the east and the Allies pushed in from the west, that their days were numbered. In October of 1944, Americans captured the first German town, Aachen. The Allies were closing in. Hitler responded with one last-ditch massive offensive. Hitler hoped breaking through the Allied line would break up Allied supplies. The Battle of the Bulge. The Battle of the Bulge raged for a month. The Germans had been pushed back. Little seems to have changed, but in fact the Germans had, had sustained, sustained heavy losses. Germany lost 120,000 troops, 600 tanks, and 1,600 planes. From that point on, the Nazis could do very little but retreat. The Liberation of the Death Camps While the British and Americans moved westward into Germany, the Soviets moved eastward into German-controlled con German Poland. The Soviets discovered many death camps that the Germans had set up within Poland. The Americans also liberated Nazi death camps within Germany. This is a map showing the location of many of the major Nazi death camps that were discovered in the lat latter stages of the war. Many of them were liberated by the Soviet Union, but some, like Buchenwald, uh, Flossenburg, uh, Gunstreichen, Dachau, Landsberg, and others were liberated by the United States and its um, British and Canadian allies. The Allies take Berlin as the Soviets took the city, uh, took Hitler's bunker, and ultimately found his body. The Soviets stormed into his underground Berlin as Hitler prepared for the end. On April 29th, Hitler married his longtime girlfriend, Eva Braun, and then wrote a last note in which he blamed the Jews for starting the war and his generals for losing the war. The next day, he gave poison to his wife and then shot himself. On VE Day, General Eisenhower accepted the unconditional surrender of the German Third Reich. On May 8, 1945, the Allies celebrated VE Day, also known as Victory in Europe Day. The war in Europe was finally over. This is a famous picture of an American soldier celebrating the end of the war. FDR died 
uh, in the latter stages of the war. He did not live to see V.E. Day, having died of a brain hemorrhage. On April 12, 1945, uh, he died, and his vice president, Harry S. Truman, became the nation's 33rd president. Section 3, The War in the Pacific. The Americans did not celebrate very long, as Japan was busy conquering an empire that dwarfed Hitler's Third Reich. Japan had conquered much of Southeast Asia, including the Dutch East Indies, Guam, and most of China. This map shows the extent of the Japanese empire, as well as some of the major battles of the uh, Japanese campaign. Starting in the southern part of the map down below, you can see the Battle of the Coral Sea, followed by Guadalcanal. Moving to the west, you can see Late Gulf, as well as Iwo Jima, followed by Okinawa. If you look at the island of Japan in the upper middle portion of the map, you'll see two red uh, explosions. Those signify the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Battle of the Coral Sea was one of the early battles uh, against the Japanese, and it was fought primarily by the Americans and the Australians. In May of 1942, they succeeded in stopping the Japanese drive toward Australia in a five-day battle of the Coral Sea. The Battle of Midway is the biggest turning point in the Pacific War. Japan's next thrust was toward Midway Island, a strategic island northwest of Hawaii. Admiral Chester Nimitz, the commander of American naval forces in the Pacific, moved to defend the island. The Americans won a decisive victory as their planes destroyed four Japanese aircraft carriers and 250 planes. This is a map showing the Battle of Midway at the upper uh, right corner of the map. Uh, it was a turning point of the war uh, as it destroyed the major air forces of the Japanese making uh, America's island hopping campaign possible. As Japan's uh, military struggled to fight off the American advance, uh, the Japanese countered by employing a new tactic, the kamikaze, also called the divine wind which is in reference to the tsunami that wiped out uh, Kublai Khan's uh, attempt to invade the island of Japan in 1260 AD. Pilots in small planes in World War II would crash into Allied ships. General MacArthur and the Allies next turned to the island of Iwo Jima, the island was critical to the Allies as a base for an attack on Japan. <clears throat> it was called the most heavily defended spot on Earth. Japanese and Allied forces suffered heavy losses in the taking of Iwo Jima. <clears throat> this photograph shows Americans planting their flag upon the island of Iwo Jima after their victory over the Japanese. Uh, at Iwo Jima, the Japanese had 20,600 troops, of which only 200 survived. The battle for Okinawa is significant because in April of 1945, as U.S. Marines invaded the island, the Japanese unleashed a massive 1900 kamikaze air attack, sinking 30 ships and killing 5,000 American seamen. <clears throat> the Okinawans cost the Americans 7,600 Marines and the Japanese 110,000 soldiers. This lopsided loss of life showed how the Japanese would fight to the death to defend every inch of Japanese soil. And the victory at Okinawa was often used as justification for the dropping of the atomic bomb, arguing that in order to take the rest of the island nation of Japan, hundreds of thousands, if not a million soldiers, would be lost on the American side. 
After Okinawa, MacArthur predicted that a Normandy-type amphibious invasion of Japan would result in 1,500,000 Allied deaths. President Harry Truman saw only one way to avoid an invasion of Japan, even though the number 1,500,000 is not based upon any study or any evidence that it would require that many American lives in order to take the islands of Japan. In fact, very much, this number was imagined in order to influence public opinion to favor the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Japan had a huge army that would defend every inch of the Japanese mainland, or so the Americans thought. The fact is that the Japanese government was desperately trying to surrender to the Americans, and when the Americans would not accept it, they desperately tried to surrender to the Soviet Union. Truman decided to use a powerful new weapon developed by scientists working on the Manhattan Project, known as the atomic bomb. The United States dropped not one, but two atomic bombs on Japan. Truman warned Japan in late July 1945 that without immediate Japanese surrender, it would face prompt and utter destruction. This is ironic, considering that as uh, much as almost a year prior to this, the Japanese had been attempting to surrender. Their one condition, that they be allowed to keep the emperor after they surrendered. Refusing to accept anything but unconditional surrender, on August 6th, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, vaporizing 200,000 innocent men, women, and children. And on August 9th, they dropped an additional bomb on Nagasaki, vaporizing another 150,000 innocent men, women, and children. And after the Japanese surrendered, the one condition that they had asked for more than a year before was granted. They were allowed to keep the emperor. Here are some photographs showing the atomic bombings at Hiroshima and at Nagasaki. The woman in the bottom right-hand corner is suffering from severe wounds, as you can see them taking her kimono off with a pair of tweezers because it has been fused to her flesh. This begs the question, what did this woman do to require this type of attack? What threat did this woman present to the United States? Think of the Nazi bombings of the Spanish town of Guernica, which so outraged the Allies because of its senseless attack upon civilians. Think also of the attack upon Pearl Harbor, and then ask yourself if this is a justified response or simply more of the same. When the United States claims to be a country that is exceptional or better than others, what exactly are we better than? Here you can see more photographs of the uh, destruction of Nagasaki. At ground zero, the rivers themselves flowed backwards. And up to a mile away, people died from burns. Notice the small child in the upper right-hand corner. She will not survive due to the radiation most likely in the rice ball that she's holding in her hand. And ask yourself, what did this child do to the United States of America? Japan surrenders after the second atomic bomb was dropped. And General MacArthur said, Today the guns are silent. The skies no longer rain death. The entire world is quietly at peace. This statement goes against the fact that the United States actually continued to firebomb Tokyo even after the Japanese surrendered. On February 1945, as the Allies pushed toward victory in Europe, an alien FDR met with Churchill and Stalin at the Black Sea Resort of Yalta in the USSR. A series of compromises were worked out concerning post-war Europe. At Yalta, they agreed to divide Germany into four occupied zones after the war. Stalin agreed to free elections in Eastern Europe, 
and Stalin agreed to help the United States in the war against Japan to join the United Nations. After the war, the Allies conducted a series of war trials known as the Nuremberg Trials. Here you can see Hermann Göring, Hitler's right-hand man and chief architect of the German war effort, as he testified at his trial. He was found guilty of war crimes, but avoided execution by swallowing a cyanide capsule that he had sewn into the collar of his jacket. He swallowed it as he was walking from the trial back to his cell. The discovery of Hitler's death camps led the Allies to put 24 surviving Nazi leaders on trial for crimes against humanity, crimes against the peace, and war crimes. The trials were held in Nuremberg, Germany. I was only following orders was not an acceptable defense, as 12 of the 24 were sentenced to death and others to life in prison. It's important to point out that all of the atrocities that the Nazis carried out became the standard for what war crimes were, whereas the bombing and murdering of innocent civilians by the Allies, both in uh, Japan as well as in uh, Germany, uh, were not included as possible war crimes. This calls into question whether a war crime is really a war crime that others can be convicted of or is merely retribution uh, and not law. The occupation of Japan was done under the command of General Douglas MacArthur, and during the seven-year occupation, MacArthur reshaped Japan's economy by introducing free market practices that led to a remarkable economic recovery. Essentially, what he did was give the United States technology to the Japanese and created a socialist economy that would allow the Japanese full employment opportunities and the ability to sell their products to, directly to the American market. Additionally, he introduced a liberal constitution that to this day is called the MacArthur Constitution. This constitution requires the United States to fight and defend the island nation of Japan against all enemies. Section 17.4 describes the home front during World War II. The war provided a lift to the U.S. economy. Jobs at home were abundant despite the rationing and shortages, and people had money to spend. By the end of the war, America was the world's dominant economic and military power. Economic gains from World War II meant that unemployment fell to only 1.2% by 1944, and wages rose by 35%. Farmers, too, benefited as production doubled and income tripled. We're reminded that this is because of the totalitarian, socialist, centrally planned economy that was put into place during World War II, in which the federal government decided how many people would be hired, the federal government decided how much people would be paid, the federal government decided how much people could spend, and the federal government decided how much people could buy. Women particularly made gains during this time, uh, although many lost their jobs after the war. Over six million women entered the workforce for the first time. Over one-third were in the defense industry. Populations also shifted as mass migrations took place. More than a million newcomers poured into California between 1941 to 1944, as many groups, such as African Americans, shifted from living in the southern states to the northern states. Jobs at shipyards and factories built to supply the war effort meant new jobs in new areas for new minorities. The GI Bill was established to help returning veterans to deal with re-entry into civilian life. Congress passed the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, known as the GI Bill of Rights, this act provided uh, government-paid education for 7.8 million veterans, and for the first time in American history, Amer Americans in the middle class would go to college in large numbers for the first time. It's important to point out two facts about the GI Bill. One is that it signifies the first time in American history when in which a majority of Americans will seek a college education. It's also important to point out that this is socialism. The internment of Japanese Americans is an ugly chapter in the war, one that recalls the internment and concentration camps used against the Jews in Germany. 
When the war began, 120,000 Americans lived in the United States, mostly on the West Coast. After Pearl Harbor, many people were suspicious uh, of possible spy activity by the Japanese. Franklin Roosevelt ordered American, Japanese Americans into 10 relocation centers, surrounded by barbed wire and guarded by men with machine guns. This is a map showing 10 of the internment camps that were used, uh, and the exclusion zone is uh, out on the west coast, where no one of Japanese ancestry would be allowed to, to be. This violates the essential nature of the Constitution and the idea that all men are allowed to pursue their life, liberty, and their happiness unfettered by government intervention. However, because of the racism and hatred stirred up by the war, the government was able to convince people to ignore the rights guaranteed to all Americans in the Constitution, very much as the way the government is able to tell people to ignore the violation of their rights stirred up by the 9-11 attacks. This is one of the camps in Jerome, Arkansas. The U.S. ultimately paid reparations to the Japanese. President Reagan signed a law that provided $20,000 to every Japanese American sent to a relocation camp, which sounds like a lot of money, but if you think about the lost opportunity and the lost capital that the Japanese uh, suffered because of it, $20,000 represents a small fraction of what that w investment and opportunity would have meant 40 years after it was initially taken from them. Checks were sent out in 1990 along with a note from President Bush saying, We can never fully right the wrongs of the past. We now recognize that serious wrongs were done to Japanese Americans during World War II. This idea of paying reparations for past actions is one that is very controversial in American history because we have not ever paid one penny for 400 years of African American slavery. Nearly 59 years after the end of World War II, a National World War II Memorial was dedicated in Washington, D.C. on Saturday, May 29, 2004, to honor the 408,680 Americans who died in the conflict. This ignores the 20 million Soviets who died in the war.